Welcome to Baca Tech Talks. Today we're going to go ahead and install Proxmox. Proxmox Virtual Environment is an open source server virtualization environment. It is a Debian based Linux distribution with a modified Ubuntu LTS kernel and allows for the deployment and management of virtual machines and containers. First thing you're going to want to do, and again I use Nano, you can use any text editor that you like, but you'd like to, uh, you need to go into the host folder and make sure that your host name here, which in this case mine is server01.bacaweb.local, you want to make sure that that is actually using the machine's IP address. All right. And the reason for that is the way that the uh, Proxmox server registers these entries into its own internal databases, that's one of the reasons. Well, it's basically required. You got to do sometimes what you got to do. Now, a good way to test this is if I go host name, IP address, you'll see that it is, of course, not an IPv6, not localhost, but it is, of course, 192.168.66.10, which is what my machine's IP address is. Now, I'm actually going to go ahead and go back into the apt-get directory and go to the sources list, but instead of, of course, doing the nano like I did last time when I did the installing of Webmin, you can also uh, add an entry to the repository like this. You can echo it in, as I'm doing here, into that direct uh, into that f uh, folder, and we're going to go ahead and create a whole re new repo into sources.list.d, which is the directory where you can store in individualized repos instead of adding it just to the repo list. So I've now created that. So if we go to that folder, there is my PVE, PVE install repo. That's how it's recommended per this install of Proxmox. And just like we did with Webmin, we're going to need to go ahead and get the key for it, which in this case, it's at download.proxmox.com Debian key.asc. And we're going to go ahead and, of course, app key add it. Now, the next part where we're going to do the app get update, it's going to be a little different than what happened with Webmin because we're also going to be doing a dist upgrade, which is a distro upgrade. The reason for that is, as I mentioned earlier, even though this is a Debian-based Linux distribution, it's a modified Ubuntu LTS kernel. So the app get dist upgrade is going to go ahead and upgrade the kernel file with the one for Proxmox. Go ahead and let that do its thing. Say yes. And as you can see here, it's updating the Grub PC, Grub Common, things like that. So basically replacing the original one with the PEVE versions. And here, of course, update the interim, intro RAM FS generating boot intra uh, image directory right there. So that's already updating that. And like I said, just goes through all this process. Alright, now that that's done, we're going to want to go ahead and install the actual Proxmox services. This is going to install Proxmox VE, make sure that SSH is installed, postfix, 
K, uh, KSM Control Damien Open iSCSI System um, Yeah System D Sys, uh, SysV and uh, I've added into this list which is not in the normal install but you're going to need it which is Open V Switch Switch now Open V Switch is actually part of Proxmox but the actual service is not installed by default when you do the normal basic install. I use it, so it's there. All right, say yes, and go ahead and allow that to install. I'm going to go ahead and stop again, and I'll be back as soon as it's done. All right, now that it's done, you're going to want to go ahead and just do a reboot. This ensures that all the um, new changes and kernels are taken into place. All right. All right, now that your system has rebooted and you've logged back in, there's a couple more things that you're going to want to do. There is a uh, service daemon known as OS Prober. The OS Prober package scans all partitions on your host, including those for your guest VMs, to create a dual boot grub entry. This, uh, this can cause file system corruption in VMs. If you didn't install Proxmox VE as a dual boot, besides another operating system, you can safely remove the OS Prober package. So that is exactly what we're going to end up doing, because I'm not going to be dual booting this machine. And then the other thing that they uh, recommend you doing, or of course it's an optional, but you can do it, is if you want to remove the existing uh, or the original Debian packages. Um, I'm personally not going to do that, but if you did, you would run this command, which is app get remove Linux images AMD64, or you know you would change that to your system type, Linux image, and so forth. Now. Once you get done doing that, what you'd want to do is also do an update grub. Update grub is going to go ahead and update your grub entries just to make sure that there is no problem. Now, once more, since I did remove the OS Prober, I'm going to go ahead and do another reboot. When I get back, I'm going to go ahead and walk you through the actual GUI for Proxmox, and we'll go from there. All right, welcome back. So booted the machine and I've logged into HTTPS my IP address for my machine colon 800 or 8006 that is the port 8006 that you want to use to get into your Proxmox setup your Proxmox login of course is going to be your root user and from here you'll be able to access everything that you need so you have your data center your server object and your storage. Now, in my uh, my configuration that I did for my, this little lab machine I'm putting together, I have an 8 gig thumb drive as my operating system drive, but I also have a 500 gig drive. My 500 gig drive, during the initial install, I configured with my var directory. Inside the var directory is going to be stored things for your containers and for your um, actual Im VM images. So from obviously setting up my VAR image, you can see here where Proxmox registers that I have a 500 gig data store. So during the initial install, that's how I had mine configured. Now, from your server node, the first thing that you're gonna wanna do on a brand new install is you're gonna wanna configure an, uh, an item here for a VM bridge. Now you can do an OVS, which is an open vSwitch bridge, Great if you're going to have, for example, multiple VLANs, things like that. Or you can just do a basic Linux bridge. For this setup, I'm going to just do a basic Linux bridge. I usually try to do that for my management one, unless, of course, you know, there is other reasons why I wouldn't. 
um, such as, for example, my management interface, I'm going to have on a v, uh, VLAN. Or, you know, I want a little bit more configuration from the start, or I want to handle how STP works, or various other options. But for this video, I'm just going to do a basic Linux bridge. Now, the first thing you're going to want to do, though, I want my IP address. So, I say remove. That removes this, uh, this IP address off of this interface. And I'm going to create a bridge. I'm going to give it back my interface, or my IP address, which is 6610 on this one, my full subnet mask, and my gateway. And then, of course, this is if you did an IPv6 address, which I'm not doing. And you can do VLAN aware on the Linux bridge. But Open vSwitch, of course, happens to be a little bit more effective. Let's just say that. And of course, bridge port of ETH0. And again, I like to comment on anything, so on everything. It's a good practice to get into. I'm going to just say that's management uplinks. Now create. And I got my brand new Linux bridge. Now, nothing is done live on Proxmox. If you need to make these configurations live, like you have a production system and you need to make a change to your network, even though on their site it's not recommended to make these network changes live onto your network interfaces directly, you know, through ET, uh, Etsy network interfaces, I've done it. There's really no major issues. However, again, that is, of course, not saying that it's going to be perfect and it's going to work every time. If you're running iSCSI, if you're running, you know, say your uh, firewalls and stuff are configured, you know, say you have a Palo Alto or Cisco or um, what's that other one? There's a couple of other ones where they're very sensitive to changes and they freak out. So... I'm not saying it's perfect. I'm not saying that's going to work for everybody, but I have done it and it is possible to do. But of course, the risk is test it out, try it in your lab, make sure it's going to work before you ever put something like that in production. So as you can see, it says to do a reboot and that's what we're going to end up doing. So up here, you'll see where it says restart, shut down, shell, so forth. I'm going to go ahead and say restart, and I'm going to go ahead and say to restart my node. Now, while that's waiting, I always like to do this. I do a ping test. That allows me to see, of course, when the machine goes down, it requests timed out. My machine comes back up. I can see it come, a uh, ping start to come through, unless there's something wrong with the network interface. So give it enough time for your system to usually boot. If it doesn't come up, go check your monitor. Another best practice coming at you from Baca Tech Talks. <laughs> but for now, let's just see if I made my changes right. And there it is. We're back up and running. So get back in. Here is my node and my network configuration. Now, my, B, uh, my regular bridge here, which is BR0, it says unknown. Ignore this in my setup. This happens to be because I have a wireless LAN set up as a um, backup network. So if this machine goes down, I can't uh, reach it directly uh, through my regular router. It's got its own wireless adapter setup, and it's set up to be a wireless router. So I log in, and I can manage it from there. So that's what that in, uh, setup is. If anybody's interested in that, you know, leave a comment. I'll make up a special video just for that. 